Well, good morning, and I'm, um, I'm glad again that we have the privilege to be here and open up God's Word together to share and consider what He has to say to us, both individually but also as a church. So I'm going to pray. I'd love if you could just pray where you are, whether you're in your lounge room or um, wherever it is that you're listening in from, and pray for our church, pray for the pastoral team of our church, and I would love it if you could be praying for me as we share from God's Word together. Lord, thank you again. What a privilege it is to be in your presence, although we feel separated from each other because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we're confident that you are present with us, even collectively as we gather in our lounge rooms via a stream. um, You are the God of all ages from beginning to end, eternity to eternity, and you are with us. You've promised that you would be with us and you are faithful to your promises. So open um, your mouth to us through your word in a way that uh, penetrates through our uh, hard hearts and speak to us, Lord, in a way that draws us closer to you and helps us to see a clear vision of who Jesus is. We pray this always dependently on you. In your name, amen. Okay, we're going to continue our uh, series looking at the whole issue of what is a pastor, who is a pastor, and in particular, we're going to talk a little bit about how that starts to work out here at Raymond Terrace Community Church. In particular, last week we looked at what is a pastor. We were thinking about how the great shepherd, um, particularly as an image from Psalm 23, helps us to look at what it means for the local shepherd or the under shepherds or elders in our local churches. And we saw some of that function of what a shepherd does, who they are. But this week, that's where we're going to focus. Um, Not just what they do, but who they should be. So who is a pastor is our primary focus for this morning. Um, I'm going to give you, as I often do, probably a summary statement that's going to be the big picture. So if you start to forget some of the other things that we talk about, um, hopefully this might stick with you. Now, here's the basic premise of where we're going to be going today. The character of a pastor matters more than the skills he brings to the team. And that's kind of where we're going to be focusing our thoughts this morning. The character of a pastor or of an elder or of an under-shepherd, of an overseer, all those words are interchangeable, remember. The character of a pastor matters more than the skills he brings to the team. It's one thing to know what a pastor is, but it's quite a different thing to consider who a pastor should be. Uh, What type of person does the great shepherd look for when putting in place under shepherds for local churches? Now, there are three, particularly in the New Testament, three primary passages that as we start to think about, you know, what type of person and who that person should be, there are three passages in the New Testament that we would normally turn our attention to just to try and um, gain some perspective, not just by what culture tells us or by the age that we live in, but what does God say in his word about local shepherds, about pastors of churches. Now, those three passages are found in 1 Timothy and in Titus and in 1 Peter. Of course, there's a bunch of other passages and verses and things that we could turn to, but um, we would here, be here for a much longer series if that was the case. So I'm going to just try to um, zoom in a little bit on those three passages, and I think it would be good for us just right from the outset to read them together. So why don't you grab your Bibles? We'll turn to 1 Timothy. That's going to be the first Um, passage that we're going to look at, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3 
and I'm going to particularly read from verse 1 through to verse 7. So if you have your Bibles there, I would love it if you could just be reading along uh, with me. 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting from verse 1. This is what Paul says to this young um, protege that he has been investing into and he's now been sent out. Timothy's been sent out and he has the responsibility of planting churches and strengthening those churches. And Paul writes this letter of instruction to him and says this. This is Uh, This saying is trustworthy. Verse 1, if anyone aspires to be an overseer, a pastor, a shepherd, he desires a noble task. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, He must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Believe that reading there for the moment. The next one I'd like you to turn to is Titus. So just flip over a few pages. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 5 down to verse 9. Just a fairly short reading. Again, Paul writing to another young guy that he's invested into. Uh, Titus, who's been sent out to the island of Crete, and there he has the same responsibility that Timothy had, which was to put in place uh, in God's church the right structure for these local churches that have been planted. So Titus chapter 1, starting from verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and, as I directed you, to appoint elders in every town or shepherds or pastors. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accursed of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. There's Paul's instruction to Titus. We've got one more that I want you to consider this morning. This one's not from Paul, it's from Peter. Here's Peter's exhortation to elders, it's found in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 1, just a few verses. 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I'll leave it there for the moment. They're the three passages in the New Testament that we would primarily turn to to think about well, who, who should be a shepherd? What type of person is God looking for to minister in this way amongst his flock? Now, if we took all three of those passages, you probably even heard as we read them back to back, there's a lot of overlap in there. Uh, it's like almost God was the author behind this, right? The Spirit was speaking through Peter, he was speaking through Paul, and he's speaking to us to consider, well, what type of shepherds should we be looking for? And for those of us who are called to be shepherds, 
What sort of people should we be? Now, we could synthesize those three passages and we could start to draw up a list. Um, It's a list which is meant to be um, maybe not exhaustive out of those three passages. We could certainly go to some other places in the New Testament. We can start to gather a little bit more nuance in some of that, but certainly that is the best place to begin. Um, Now, if we do that, we could come up with a list that I think is going to be helpful to us and synthesize it. Here's what it would look like. I want you to notice that as we start to do that, we're not looking at um, a bunch of skill sets, not primarily. Uh, It would be interesting to look at the pastoral teams of local churches, we've done it here in ours, and start to look at what are the various skills that each person brings to the team. And we've all got different skills, we've got different strengths, and we could highlight, they're, they're measurable things, aren't they? They're things that are very easy to discern. Are they good at doing you know, something in particular, or another person seems to be very good at something else? But one of the things that happens as you synthesise these three passages is the emphasis not on skills, but on character. So I want you just to to think about this list. In no particular order, we get this. Certainly, faithfulness in their relationships is really important. Faithful husbands. I think if they were single, the principle there is not necessarily that only married men could be a pastor or a shepherd, But the type of faithful life that's displayed by someone who is committed to the relationship that they are in, that's what God is looking for, that type of character. Secondly, he was looking for those that are blessed with children, how do they parent their children? How do they seek to instruct them in the Lord? Are they the type of um, overlording fathers that um, squash their children's character into obedience? Or are they ones that let their children's character flourish, but at the same time shaping them and pointing them continually towards Christ? They're the sort of person that is reasonable. They're calm. They're long-tempered, not short-tempered the sort of person that can face varying, maybe even stressful situations without having a short fuse. That's the type of character that God's looking for in a shepherd. And believe me, that's needed. We would see from those passages that the type of character that's required is someone who is self-controlled, a fruit of the Spirit, right? Right? that the Spirit is evident in their life in such a way that there is self-control, self-discipline, that they're gentle. Not that they just know when not to have a second piece of cake or a third helping from the buffet bar, not that type of self-control or self-discipline, but the type that can be able to control their thoughts and emotions in any given situation to be able to act calmly and respectfully and gently. They need to be respected. They need to be, here's a hard word, blameless. We're going to come back to that in a little while. But notice that in some of those passages in particular, the reference was not just respected and blameless within their church community, but blameless and respected in the wider community. These are people who are seen and looked up to in their business dealings maybe in how they treat business partners, how do they treat their staff if they are in positions of leadership in their workplace? If not, how do you treat those who are above you in positions of authority in your workplace? How do you speak about others when you're just with your friends? All of those things matter. They are to be well thought of, respected and blameless in their community. Able to teach. We're going to come back to that one in a little while, so I won't speak too much about it. Able to teach and to preach. Uh, Knowledgeable, it says, in doctrine, in those lists. You need to know God's Word. You need to be invested in God's Word. You need to have a love for God's Word, that it becomes the guiding principle. Willing to correct and rebuke 
That can be hard. Um, I, I grew up quite afraid of conflict. I didn't see conflict much in my home. And so when I did see conflict elsewhere, it frightened me. And so I tend to be a person who runs from conflict a little bit. That's my natural inclination. And yet the type of character that's required, although very clearly we don't want to be bullies, it's very clear that we don't want to be um, sort of hot-headed and short-tempered and there needs to be a gentleness, but, but the type of character that needs to call something out when it needs calling out, the type of character that can step into a situation to correct where required, even to rebuke when it's needed. Hospitable shows up in that list. I think this is one of the ones that surprises me the most when I go through the list of qualifications for a pastor or an elder. Able to teach, that seems to fit. Uh, The type of character which is, you know, um, not given to much uh, excesses in drinking or anything like that. Yeah, we, we understand that, but hospitable. Why is it so important? I think it's important because it's in our homes that people start to see the gospel really start to work out. And so shepherds and elders, they aren't just people who are sitting in a spotlight on a stage in front of a camera. That happens on occasion. But where the real work of shepherding happens is over kitchen tables, in lounge rooms, sitting around a fire in someone's backyard, sitting on their deck and hearing them pour out their griefs. Hospitable characters where your home is a place of refuge and welcome for others in need and where you love and are welcomed in other people's homes. Hospitality is important. So these are all the things that pastors should be, elders should be, but there's also in these three passages a reference to some things that they shouldn't be. So let's go through those. They shouldn't be greedy. They shouldn't be the people that are looking for some type of financial gain because of their position in a church, whether they are paid as a shepherd a paid pastor, or whether they are um, volunteering their time outside of their normal life and family as a shepherd. There should be no inclination towards what do I get out of this, whether that be financial gain or I think even some type of reputation or prestige. They're not greedy. They're not arrogant. They're not the sort of person that takes their um, position of responsibility in the church that God has entrusted with them and somehow think that that makes them some type of super Christian, some type of advanced model of what it means to be a disciple. They're not arrogant people. They demonstrate the same type of leadership that Jesus demonstrates when he was willing to get on his knees and clean the filthy feet of his disciples. It's servant leadership. Shouldn't be short-tempered. They shouldn't be contentious. A contentious person is a person who just loves to argue. It doesn't matter about what, they just love a good argue, right? They they love a good debate. Now, yeah, of course, when we get together as shepherds, when we get together as an elders meeting, sometimes we debate stuff. Sometimes there's differences of opinion. Sometimes we've got to work things through to seek what God is really saying to us. But we shouldn't be walking into those meetings, rubbing our hands together, going, man, I can't wait to hammer it out tonight. We're not the sort of people, God says, that should be loving the fight, loving the debate, loving the contention. They shouldn't be addicted to drugs or drink, right? They they shouldn't be um, finding their solace in a bottle. They, They shouldn't be going, what do I need to really wind down? I know what I need. I need a nice, good single malt. Now, does it mean that you can't have, maybe another discussion, Um, do Christians drink or not? And maybe different people have different convictions about that. But here, it makes it very clear, if you do, before the Lord, have a freedom towards enjoying an alcoholic drink, for say, they shouldn't be the sort of person that runs to that or is addicted to that or goes to it to find some level of comfort. And the last thing they shouldn't be is they shouldn't be a recent convert to the faith. They shouldn't be a new Christian. Does that mean new Christians are worse than more experienced Christians? No. But just like a child learns to walk, and the Bible references our Christian faith as being like growing from babies towards maturity, 
It's important that those that are shepherding and caring for other people, it says, aren't in a new faith, that it's had some time to be seasoned and tested and developed as they start to then shepherd and care for others that have been entrusted to them. That's, that's a summary, I guess, in one sense, of what a synthesis of those three passages could look for. There are two lists, things they must be, things they must not be. And I want you to notice that at the beginning I said that the, the main summary of this whole week is really that the character of a person, the character of a pastor or of a shepherd matters more than the skills that he brings to the team. And that synthesis that we get from those three passages, it demonstrates that. They're issues of character. In fact, the only place that we see a real particular skill mentioned there is an aptitude to teach. The ability to open God's word and teach and show other people what it says is important. But all the other things that we mentioned are character issues. See, it matters most to God the character of a person who shepherds the church, not just what skills they have. There are lots of skills that are maybe even useful in a local church. Management skills, leadership skills, financial skills in recent times, technical skills. But they don't matter so much to God in what it means to shepherd the church. To shepherd the church, he's looking for men of character. You see, there's a defining skill that is required in here, and it matters though. Even though character is the main thing that we're looking for, one defining skill is what Paul tells Timothy, he says, an aptitude to teach. Or he tells Titus he must be able to handle God's word in a way that can both instruct and rebuke. An aptitude to teach. It's good to note what isn't on the, on the list, right? It's good to, to note what isn't there on the skill list, like leadership skills or creativity or certain personality profiles even. They don't rank on the list that we have in Scripture But it is important that shepherds know how to open up God's word with someone, whether that be in a situation like this, in a live stream, or more preferably, standing behind maybe a pulpit in front of a congregation that gathers, preaching. Or maybe it's in a small group. Or maybe it's over a kitchen table. But whatever the context might be, shepherds must know know how to open up God's word and faithfully and carefully bring somebody else into it in a way that it is God's authority and God's voice that instructs them, not ours. An aptitude to teach is important, although it may look different from one person to the next. Now, you may have heard my language over the course of our time already together. Um, I've been using pastor or shepherd or elder in the masculine sense because not only do we have this character list not only do we have a defining skill that has been identified we have what is for some I think maybe a controversy the fact that it seems that as we read through these New Testament passages Paul makes it abundantly clear in how he uses the language that the expectation for the shepherd is that they be a male. Now, I realise that for some of you, maybe, depending on your background or where you've come from, that could be a little bit jarring. It certainly is in the culture that we live in today. Um, And straight away, we can start to sort of go, well, you know, maybe Paul was a chauvinist or maybe Paul was speaking just as a, a mouthpiece of his time, of his era in the first century. And look, it is a bigger subject than we have time to go to today. But I want to just at least highlight the fact that pastoral leadership in how we understand it from the Scriptures here at Raymond Terrace Community Church is primarily seen as being an area that God calls men into. It doesn't negate in any way 
the role of women broadly across the church in a countless amount of ways that we can serve to, together. It certainly doesn't make one gender um, more significant than another in Paul's views or certainly in ours as a church. But the sense of who can be called into the role of pastor, of elder here in Raymond Terrace Community Church, it is our conviction and our understanding that we see from the scriptures that it is primarily entrusted to men. Some would say they are held responsible, but I disagree with that. I don't think that men are held responsible for the health of the church. I think both men and women are. I think both elders and anybody else is. I think both children and adults are held responsible for the health of their church. Similarly, in a marriage, in a home, in a family, both husband and wife are held responsible for the spiritual health of their church, of their family. It's not about responsibility. It's about who is answerable. So we believe one day, I believe one day, I will stand before God, as will all the shepherds of this church over the course of the life of this church. Not to be responsible for the church, but to be answerable, to give an account for how we shepherded the church. I believe, we believe, as we read through the scriptures, that it is men who have been entrusted to the role of shepherds who will give an answer to the Lord. All of us take responsibility. No matter who you are, we are all responsible to use our gifts, to use what God has given us to shepherd and help and teach and instruct and encourage one another to walk closely to Jesus. But shepherds will stand before the Lord to give an answer for how we've done that. It's a heavy list, blameless, above reproach, instructing our family well. Those character items weigh heavy. They do do on me. I know how much I've failed in some of those areas. I know how much I fail on them regularly. How does the gospel inform our understanding of shepherds? If we were to say only blameless people can come into this role, well then, from humans' perspective, from from the eyes of the flesh, my own my own heart, I say, well, I need to resign. Who who could who could do that, right? And if I just think about it from a spiritual point of view, then in Christ, we're all blameless if we've had our sins forgiven. All of us can do that. Why does Paul call us to be blameless and above reproach in this whole list? How does the gospel inform us? Look, people are fallible. People fall in countless ways. I have, we all do. And humanly speaking, No one could do this role. Pastors, though, should lead the way, I think. Shepherds and elders should be leading the way in what it looks like when we fall. What does it look like when we sin? What does it look like for a disciple who is committed to their walk with Jesus? What does it look like when we fall? shepherds should be the first to model what it looks like to confess, to repent, to to fall on the grace of the gospel in Christ. They should be the first to look like, rather than retreating and running away from the community of faith in our failures, that we would run to them, to see what does it look like to walk beside someone for accountability? What does it look like to share our struggles What does it look like to be fallen creatures who love Jesus and see the grace of the gospel as calling us ever deeper into relationship with him? So it's not so much that 
Elders are above sin, that they're above falling, that they are the ones who run and show what it looks like first and demonstrate and point other people, yes, we are fallen and yes, we are broken, but yes, come with me as I show you how to fall in the grace of Jesus. That's important. We should set an example of even what it looks like to come back to Jesus after failure or sin, to confess our sins, to seek forgiveness, to restore relationships. Elders and shepherds and pastors should be setting the example. You see, pastors need the gospel just as much as any of you do, as any of us do. Shepherds need the gospel just as much as the rest of the church does. We are in desperate need of Jesus' grace. That's the type of person that the great shepherd, that Jesus is looking for to shepherd his flock here in Raymond Terrace. Now, we've got one more week in this series, and we're going to draw our attention a little bit more closely around um, the passage that we read in 1 Timothy 3, but where I finish reading, that passage continues on. We're going to start to talk a bit about deacons. Now, that's one of the places we see this masculine um, and masculine feminine language shift and change in the same passage. When Paul talks about elders, shepherds in 1 Timothy 3, he uses the masculine word, men. As soon as he gets to verse 8 and he starts to talk about deacons, he starts to use um, terminology which is male and female, both. And we will see that as Paul talks about shepherds and then deacons, he distinguishes between the two by gender as well. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more next week about what a deacon is. How are they the same as a pastor or an elder and how are they different? And in particular, what does that look like here at Raymond Terrace Community Church? Next week also, we're going to start to unpack a little bit more of the practical outworking of what does this look like? How do we appoint pastors here? How do we bring new shepherds in? Uh, What about shepherds that have been around for a while? Do they just stay here forever? We're going to talk a little bit more about the role of the shepherd and how that works in practical terms. But right now I'd love to pray. The team's going to come back up again. And I would love for you to be praying just for the shepherds of our church. I want to remind you that last week we announced... Um, that Matt Blanche, who used to be a part of our pastoral team, but for various reasons had to step down. um, And he has now had a little break away uh, from the shepherding life of the church formally. And we've invited him to come back into the pastoral team. He desires that and wants to do that. And we're giving you a little bit of time just to um, chat with us about any questions or concerns. You might have that. But next week, Lord willing, we hope to commission him into that role. I'm going to pray, the team's going to come up and then we're going to just do, um, would you pray, would you pray for the shepherds of this church, the pastors of this church, the elders of this church, we desperately need your prayers and we we appreciate those that have reached out, particularly in trying times like that, just to say, hey guys, um, we we really are grateful for what you're doing, it's encouraged us to continue on um, in caring and shepherding the flock here. Lord, thank you for your word, thank you for the way that it convicts us. I've been convicted as I've been preparing for this. But Lord, thank you for the way that it encourages us, shows us the type of care that you give to the church. Um, Lord, help us to conform to your word in it. Help us to be um, a church committed to your, your purposes and your plans. Um, Lord, where we fall and where we fail, Lord, draw us to yourself Convict us, rebuke us through your word and uh, help us to see clearly your purpose and plan and yourself. We thank you for the gospel that invites us in. And Lord, I want to pray for the pastoral team of this church, uh, the guys that I get to serve alongside of. And I pray for them that they would continue to lean into you, that we would do that together as a team. Um, that you would That you would help our church to grow in health because of the, even the weak ways that we are able to somehow encourage and serve. But Lord, continually we look to you. You are our great shepherd, the one that we find our hope in. And so Lord, be near to us, we pray. 
in Jesus' name, amen.